Hello, welcome back. Thanks for calling in on Discovering the Real God. We're continuing this study on what makes God hear, what makes God listen to us, what, what makes God take notice of us. And uh, in the last session, we, we were beginning to talk about the scriptures, why God won't hear us. And I, I talked, I, I, I quoted the scripture from uh, 1 Peter 3 about men treating their wives well so that God will hear their prayers because if you don't treat your wife according to how God has dictated that that you love your wife and take care of her then God will not hear your prayers he said he won't listen I said I was going to talk about my wife and I am going to my wife is a godly woman She's, I say a wife in a million, probably that's underestimating it really. She will not shift from her position. In that, she expects me to lead so that she can follow. Now that, that sounds ideal, uh, and it is. And it's biblical, but I, to be honest, it can be very frustrating at times because it puts the onus for absolutely everything on me. Everything that we do is on my shoulders. Sometimes I'd love her to decide, but she will not. Most women, I say most women, and I think that's this is true. Most women would leap into the driver's seat, taking that opportunity to be in charge, but she will not. She knows her position before God. And whilst I continue in the same way that I am, and I believe I'm loving her, respecting her, and uh, taking care of her, making her feel secure, I don't think she'll ever change that position. So, in actual fact, that being the case, the effect it has on me is to, I try harder to get things right, because there's nothing worse than having to go to your wife and say, no, we did this, I decided it, and look, it's, it's not turned out right, it, I, I got it wrong. She, she makes nothing of it. She, she doesn't even shrug her shoulders. She, she makes nothing of the fact that I've got it wrong. Because, what can she say, I suppose? I don't know, I've never asked her that, and maybe I should do. But she never comments. She might encourage me and say, well, it, it doesn't matter. It's all right. She, she's always encouraging. So, we've talked a little about sin and um, having things unresolved, unrepentant sin, known and unknown. The problem is ignorance is never an excuse. The onus is on our behaviour, our towards our family, and and towards our brothers and sisters, towards life in general. The onus to meet the requirements of the new covenant is squarely at our door. It's true in life in general as well. I mean, ignorance is no excuse. God will not have an excuse. He won't listen to excuses. That's the other thing he won't listen to. I mean, if you get stopped by the police for speeding, um, I mean, I got stopped and I got prosecuted because I was doing 35 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. I hadn't realised. I mean, you'd, you'd think it was nothing, but nevertheless, I'd gone over the margin of error and I got prosecuted. Um, the thing is, I couldn't say that... Uh, I didn't know. I could have said that. 
I could have said, well, I, I didn't know, I wasn't aware that it was a 30 mile an hour zone. But who would listen? Certainly not the police. I, if I took it to court, the, the, the judge, the magistrate wouldn't listen because you're deemed to have realised if you're driving a car and you've passed your test, then you should know when you're in a 30 mile an hour zone. Say now, I didn't know, officer, that won't get us very far, would it? It's the same with everything else. It's the same with God. God says he won't listen to sinners. Now, okay. We're not sinners, are we? Yes, we are. But the fact is, we deal with it. Now, if it's not dealt with, this is what we're talking about here, I believe, in uh, John 9.31, says here, now we know that God hears not sinners. But if any man be a worshipper of God, and does his will, him he hears. So he won't listen to sinners, he will listen to a man who does his will. So if you've got sin that's not dealt with, then it needs to be dealt with. And because God switches off his ears. Somehow, I don't know how he does it. We can't do that. I mean, if we've got a child crying in the night, you, you say, you, you lay there and think, oh, I'll just wait a bit longer, I'll just wait a bit longer just to see if they're going to go off to sleep. And they don't. You've got to get up. Because you can't switch off your ears love to sometimes wouldn't you <laughs> see David talking about the wicked and he's talking about God's people he said then he shall be judged let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin that was a man after God's own heart saying that I know it's Old Testament, but I mean, the fact is, if you've got a Bible and you only count the New Testament, well, why do you carry the other part? Why not, why not just buy the New Testament and live by that? Why not rip it off, rip it in half, throw that bit away? No, we like the Old Testament when it suits us. <laughs> it's there for a reason. It's there for a reason. Now I've seen people, and I think I've been in that position as well, certainly I have anyway, there's no might about it, no question, that I've lived my life at times in opposition to God, since becoming a, a Christian that is. Um, Christians can live in opposition to God, believing they are righteous. They just can't see that they're at fault. I know I've been through that, I could have, nothing wrong with me, but there was. Now, you can become hard-hearted and stiff-necked, not realising it, thinking you're the same person you always were. I, I know that, I, I mean, I've got the t-shirt, to, to use the vernacular. It, it's, it's so easy actually more easy than you think more simple than it's believable that you can actually backslide and still think that you are walking the walk talking the talk living the life i mean these scriptures are aimed at god's people let's remember that even in in the New Testament, the Old Testament, God rarely addressed the world about their conduct. He, 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 he realised that they're wicked. They, they're not worshipping him. You know, people, we talk about the world and see the world and tuk, 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 but they're not worshipping our God. Why should we be concerned about what they do? It might be immoral. It might be horrible. But what do we expect? I mean, it doesn't matter, 
really, whether you believe it or not. God's culture and God's rules apply. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright are his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he loves him that follows after righteousness. Goodness me. I mean the thing is this. If you are walking in that way, if you've become hard-hearted, stiff-necked, and have drifted away from God, God's never going to hear you. You'll, he'll probably bring you up with a jolt. You'll, he'll, he'll do something to get your attention. As we've said that before. It says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. If you're walking in righteousness, bearing the fruits of righteousness, it's not just the Old Testament that talks about righteous living. There is righteousness and bearing the fruits of righteousness in the New Testament. We have to walk that way if God's going to take notice of us. He turns, he that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. So if you're not walking in the covenant, God won't listen. Now, you might say, oh, that's old Old Testament stuff, but listen to this. From when comes, where comes wars and fighting among you, come they not hence? even of your own lusts, that war in your members. He's talking to the body of Christ. You lust and you have not. You kill. You desire to have and cannot obtain. Hate is the spirit of murder. You kill. It's all there. It's in your heart. It's not what you've actually done. It's what's in your heart he's talking about. You fight and war, yet you have not. You've striven to get it for yourself, it's saying. Because you ask not, you've not even asked. You ask not and receive not, because you ask a miss, even when you ask, it's wrong. That you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Wow, that's really strong, isn't it? That is really strong. But, if you are not asking in line with God and in righteousness, according to what Jesus told us, and we'll come on to that, Because you're asking out of greed, asking out of, I'm not saying you, I'm saying we, one. Asking out of greed, asking out of covetous, covetousness. You're asking out of want, not need. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. God knows what you need. There's nothing wrong with asking for it. There's nothing wrong with asking for what you want. God indulges us. God is, God's indulged me many times. He's been very, very generous. And I've known that I've known that I've not, not needed it. I've got a motorcycle standing in my garage that's an indulgence from God. It's a big it's a big bike and I like it and I go out on it from time to time. It's not that I need it. I don't need it. But God provided it. And I was led to it by the Lord. Even when I had one before that, and even the one I've got now that was replaced, God just laid it all out. It was one of those things. It was an indulgence. It's an indulgence. And I know that.
So God's people can be living in opposition to God like the heathen. You can be you can't go back into the world, but you can go into Babylon. So we're beginning to formulate a whole picture of why God won't listen and why he will listen. So again, we've come to the end, perhaps, of this study. But let me just say that people living in opposition to God, perhaps without realising, They, it's something that happens slowly. Someone can drift into it unawares. It's through ignorance, perhaps, we could do it quickly. And, you know, really, I th I, when I first started this blog, I, I talked, the study, I talked about being given inaccurate information in the church. The very, very place that we are there amongst our brethren for guidance in the first place. But there is error. We're given erroneous quotations that are not from the Bible. God always answers prayer, but he doesn't, as we've seen so far, and we've got a little way to go yet. We can walk in error because we're believing in what would you say? Traditions of the elders. People just quote these things. And they're not in the Bible. They're not God's word. They're not even God's will. You know, cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> People say things, don't they? Off the cuff. They just say things. And, it, and it's not true. So again, we've come to the end of this session and uh, we'll pick it up again next time and see if we can continue with the study of God hearing us. Hopefully that we will be relevant by the time we've finished. Relevant to the people around us because we know God. We walk with God. See you soon. God bless you. Bye bye.